Thanks very much, Rose. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, I've spoken to Oasis groups, I think, uh, twice before this, so it's uh, good to be back. Haven't done it in a, a few years. Um, so today what I want to do is to tell you about uh, making, how to make learning stick, to tell you about some strategies for doing that, uh, since, as I see, most of you are my age, and we're all starting to, many of you are my age, or uh, some of you are younger, um, starting to worry about our memories. Uh, this book is intended, and, and the program of research that's behind this book, it's a very research-based book, is intended to help everybody from elementary school children up through older adults. And I'm happy, I'm going to focus this kind of around education because that's usually the talk I give, but all of the things I'll be saying apply to all of us all of the time. And I'll be giving some examples uh, through, I kind of give two versions of this talk. One is a uh, uh, storytelling version and another one is a graph and slide version. I'm kind of blending the two today and um, will uh, uh, be showing, and this is after all Academy of Science, so I do have some of the science in here, uh, but I'll try to talk you through it if you're not a science person uh, to get the points across. As Rose mentioned, um, most of what I'll be saying, but not all, is in the Make It Stick book, available over there at 20% off <laughs> afterwards, if you're interested, uh, by Peter Brown, who's a professional writer, Mark McDaniel, who's another psychologist at Washington University and a good friend of mine. Uh, and so we all three put our efforts together. Uh, Mark and I supplied the research. Peter supplied lots of interviews with people and lots of stories to make the research come alive more than you would get from two psychologists writing about their research, uh, which is to say much more lively than we would have been able to do it. Um, let's talk a little bit about higher education. Um, think about going to college. Um, and um, there's a kind of division of labor in universities, uh, and I think it's true in high school uh, and on down through education as well, that we think of a number of activities as making what makes learning work in the university. Uh, attending lectures, um, reading the textbook. Uh, when people study, students study, they kind of reread things. They sometimes now have internet uh, discussion groups. Um, they look at the internet. So all those things can lead to learning. And if we ask in higher education, well, how do we know if learning has occurred? Well, of course, we have our standard methods, tests and exams, sometimes term papers and essays. Uh, and so this is the division of labor. And um, what I want to ask today and the question and to tell you I think it's wrong is that this division of labor really is uh, not the right way to think about education, even though uh, we all tend to do it that way. And I'll try to explain why. We asked students, uh, we did this in, in, it was Washington University students, but the work is, these surveys have been replicated at UCLA and Kent State and Columbia and other places. Uh, we asked students, say, hey, you've got a test coming up in a week. Tell us how you get ready for that test. What do you do? And the top three things here are what most students say they do. Their favorite strategy of studying is to, have, in the first place, have highlighted material and highlighted their notes or underline them, and then they go back through and they read them. Uh, that's the main way students say they prepare for a test, so simply reviewing and rereading notes from class or from their book. Occasionally they say they use these four strategies at the bottom, which actually are much better than the ones at the top, but most students don't use those ones at the bottom. So keep those ones in the bottom <laughs> in mind, because that will be the best way for you to learn and remember, too, as I'll talk about soon. Uh, so, and also I want to pose a question. What I'm going to show you is that the way students, even Washington University students, very good students, the way they study, and they've been doing this uh, their whole lives. Basically, they've been in school. They should know what they're doing, right? How, how is it that I will show you that they can't predict their own performance? They don't know what really improves their learning and memory and does, what doesn't. And I think it's a really interesting puzzle as to why that is. And I didn't either, uh, and I will show you once we get further on into it, uh, give you a, a plausible hypothesis about 
uh, why learners aren't aware of the best strategies for learning. Let me tell you how I used to teach introductory psychology. It's my favorite course to teach because you get people fresh in, they don't know anything at all about psychology, and so they're kind of tabula rasa there, and you can uh, uh, tell them. These days, actually, a lot of uh, high schools teach psychology, which when I was growing up, nobody taught psychology. Uh, but at any rate, so, so today some people come in. So I would always, so it was a standard introductory psychology. I would assign a textbook. Um, there would be a few other readings. I'd have them do short things here and there. I'd have them read a first person account of mental illness, um, uh, either a fiction, a work of fiction, or in this case, uh, William Styron's book is a great book called Darkness Visible, it's about his own case of depression. Um, and um, I, I want, I always assign a book on depression because depression is something most of my students will face at some point in their lives that, uh, maybe not most, but at least a lot. Uh, depression is kind of the common cold of mental illness. Many of us uh, have it at some point in our lives, I have. Um, and then I give them, uh, but the, the point here is so they do all this reading, that's what learning is, and then uh, what do I do to see if they uh, learned anything? Well, I give them two tests and a final exam, and I have them write a paper on the book. Uh, but I always thought, well, I even used to tell students, well, tests, they're just, uh, you know, I'm required by the university to give you grades, and so that's why I give you tests. I've got to sort you out somehow. Uh, but I always said, you know, tests kind of get in the way of learning. That's kind of the view of education. Uh, now I want, what I want to tell you is that, that I believe that's totally wrong. Uh, that the act of testing is absolutely critical to education. Um, and I'll tell you how I came to this realization. It was actually uh, a lot of research researchers in every field, I always hear them say, Oh, teaching is good because it informs my research. Well, I, I, that's true for me too, but also uh, in my case, research totally changed the way I teach. Uh, and we're trying to uh, promulgate this change with lots of other people. Uh, and I want to argue this change, the, the way I'm going to recommend that you learn and remember and use information would help any of you with learning names and faces, all the stuff that uh, everybody has problems with names and faces, by the way. Every, if you ask memory complaints, learning names and faces is number one for young adults, uh, for older adults. But we do know it gets harder as you age. It's harder to learn new uh, names and faces as you get older. What I'm going to tell you really helps do this if you can pull it off. Anyway, here, let me just tell you this simple experiment I did over 20 years ago that first got me thinking uh, the way I now think. And the experiment was about something else entirely. I'm not even going to tell you what it was, but as part of the experiment, students heard a story. And so they just listened to the story, and we told them to pay attention. And during the story, objects were mentioned in the story. So a horse, for example. And a picture of a horse would pop up when the horse was mentioned the first time. Uh, and so forth and so on. All together, while they're listening to this long story, they saw 60 pictures. And we told them ahead of time, we want you to remember those pictures. That's what we're going to test you on. Pay attention to the story, because that's going to help you remember them. And in fact, it does. Uh, but we really want you to write down the names of those pictures. So all the pictures were very easily nameable things, like seeing a horse and naming a horse. Um, and then right after they heard the story and saw the pictures, we either let them go home, said, come back a week later, we'll test you, or we tested them once right away. We gave them a blank sheet of paper, seven minutes to recall all the pictures they could, or we did that three times. We took away the first sheet of paper for another group, gave them a second one, said, do it again. Recall everything you can, uh, both the things that you already have recalled and anything new you can remember. And then we made them do it a, a third time. So, and then everybody went home and they came back a week later. And what I'm going to show you on the next graph is what happened after a week. But notice the, in the first place, if we just gave them a test right after they studied the pictures, they got about 32 pictures. So about half of them they could remember. Again, this is not recognizing, this is having to come up with the names. You're just sitting there looking at a blank sheet of paper and you have to uh, come up with as many as you can. Um, 
So what happened a week later? Well, if they hadn't taken any tests at all, they went from 32 at the first week down to about half as many, 50% forgetting. They only got 16. But if they'd taken one test, they got about 24. So they didn't show as much forgetting. And amazingly, if they took three tests, they didn't show any forgetting at all. They got all 32 of them the next week. And so this to me was, oh, wow, testing is really powerful. The act, think of it this way. What, what we think of in education and in learning, you know, when you read a book, you say, okay, I've got to get this stuff into my mind. So we practice getting stuff into our minds, being familiar with it. What we don't practice is how to get it out when we need it. And what testing and what I call retrieval practice does is to help you get things uh, to practice retrieving them, coming up with them. So when people learn names and faces, they sit there and study the names and faces. What you really need to do is to look at the face and then try to come up with the name. That's what you have to do when you bump into the person someplace. Uh, you have to come up with the name. Practice what you're going to need to do. So a lot of our education is all about stuffing the head full of information, but we hardly ever worry about being able to access and use the information when we want to. That's uh, a big difference. Um, so this, uh, what I'm saying is this is, uh, has an old history in psychology. I wasn't the one who discovered it, um, but uh, I'm the one who, who, in the last 10 or 15 years, has popularized it. So testing not, testing not only measures, I mean, we usually think of testing in education like a dipstick to measure oil or something. You just drop the test in the student's head, pull it out, and see how much they remember. Well, it does much more than that. Tests don't just assess what we know. They change what we know. They strengthen and improve it because you're practicing getting the information out of memory. And so we did a lot of these experiments with very simple materials like the pictures that I just talked about or wordless. And then we tried to say, well, can we make this happen with more complicated materials? So we tried uh, just giving people prose passages, uh, about 250 words, and they got four shots at it, either studying or testing the passage. One of the passages was about the moon, another one was about sea otters, those kinds of passages. Um, and the task was simply to learn the key ideas in the passage. Just learn everything you can from the passage. We're going to test you later. And one group just studied it a whole lot. They got the passage. We took it away, let them wait a little while, gave it to them again, and so forth for four times. Uh, a second group, this is three different groups of people, uh, a second group got one test. They studied it three times, just like this group, but now at the very end, we just gave them a blank sheet of paper and said, write out all the things you can uh, that you could about the passage. They got about 70% of the ideas in the passage. And another condition, they always studied it uh, during one study period, and then we made them take three tests. And you, they really don't like that. It's hard. You've got to write out everything you can. We take that away and say, OK, here's another sheet of paper. Do it again. And try to remember more stuff if you can. Uh, so that's the three test condition. And after, so each, there are three different groups of people, about 30 people in each group. Uh, and after that, we ask them, hey, uh, we're going to test you a week later. How well do you think you'll do? Just on a one to seven scale where seven, I think I'll really remember it well. And one is, I don't think I'll remember it very well at all. Uh, so um, how well will you remember this in a week? This is called a judgment of learning. It's what we should ask students to do, right? They should be able to judge their own learning. These were, uh, in this case, Washington University students. Um, and so here's what they predicted they would do a week later. If they read that passage four times, they were sick of it. They thought, you know, you read something over and over, and you think, God, I'll never forget this. Those stupid sea otters are burned into my memory. I'll never forget those sea otters and what they do and where they live. And, um, so how'd they do a week later? So this is the group that studied four times, thought they'd do best. The group that, if they took a test, that knocked down their confidence. If they only studied once and took three times, they thought they would do the worst. Um, how'd they do a week later? Same three groups. Exactly the opposite. 
the people who had taken, always studied once, but taken three tests, did the best. Uh, the group that had studied over and over, but never been tested, they'd never practiced retrieving the information. They just studied, they practiced getting it into mind. They didn't practice getting it out. You can see they did the worst. They showed the most forgetting. And the one test group was intermediate. Sometimes uh, the one test group always bounces around, sometimes a little lower, sometimes a little higher. We never have figured out why. But three tests is always better than one test. Two tests is better than one test. Um, so, um, so why do people mispredict like this? So here they are, college students. They've been studying their whole lives, taking tests their whole lives. Why is it they mispredict? Well, uh, here's the secret to it. We had a different group of people that weren't tested a week later. They were tested, they got the same manipulations, the same studying four times or three times with one test or studying one time with three tests. And then we just uh, waited about five minutes and then tested them immediately. And when we tested them immediately, they did just like they predicted. They got the right order anyway. So if you, if you test people just immediately, five minutes after learning, all that studying, that's just what students call cramming. And you'll remember cramming really works as long as you don't need to know something for very long. If I just read it over and over and you give me an immediate test, I know it. Uh, but a week later, I don't know it if I learn that way. So we look at uh, the huge amount of forgetting over, so this is a group that got an immediate test. They got nearly 90%, but then they dropped down to 40%. Here's the group uh, that studied only once and got three tests. Well, they only got the 70% I mentioned, but then they still knew over 60% of it a week later. So practicing retrieval helped consolidate those memories, made them retrievable a week later in a way that simply staring at the material, even trying hard to learn it, because these are Washington University students, they're very competitive, they're trying to learn. Uh, and so why this happens, why is it that we, it, it's very hard for me right now uh, to predict how well I can do a week from now. All I know is what I know right now. It's very, very hard to predict learning in the distant future. I mean, even a week later, much less a year later. Um, and so what happens is this repeated reading which students do in classes in which we all do to some extent when we're trying to learn something, the reason that feels so good is because it is good as long as we just test people immediately. It's only a problem if you delay things and then the learning goes away. And students kind of intuitively know this. Cramming gets me through the test, but you really don't want to do it for anything you want to remember for a long period of time. So if I just need to know uh, I learned all the names uh, of my students when they take my class, which as I get older and, and they stay the same age every year, gets harder and harder for me. But that's exactly what I do. I simply make a little card, like a flash card, students face on one name, on one side, their name on the other side, and I just practice those uh, until I have them all down. One problem is, of course, the picture I get is usually from their senior prom in high school and they look great, and then they show up in my class and they're barely recognizable, but that's a different problem. I can usually overcome that with a little practice. Uh, I should just take out my cameras or take pictures the first day of class instead of using the one that was on their application. Um, so this helps, uh, what I'm gonna show you is this pattern over and over, this uh, how learning how things that produce very good learning at first often don't produce good long-term retention. And that's a big problem that we don't recognize in our schools uh, and we don't recognize in ourselves. We did a lot of experiments in Columbia, Illinois, not far from here. Uh, we found a, uh, a uh, school system that was very happy. Most school systems aren't happy to have psychologists show up and say, hi, we'd like to do experiments in your classroom. But the Columbia uh, Middle School and then later Columbia High School did, um, and uh, we were very fortunate. But we did lots of experiments saying, can we take this stuff that we've learned in the lab with sea otters and pictures and stuff and apply it in the classroom? So we went into classrooms. We started with sixth grade uh, science and social science, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, and 
so we just went into classrooms, and one way we got into the schools is we said, we're not going to really change much of anything. Use your textbooks, use all your normal teaching methods. All we want to do is to take three or four minutes a class on some days and do a little something else. The teacher got a little break. She went out and got coffee. Almost all of them were she's the first year. Uh, and, um, well, and we had a research assistant who came in and did something. And what the research assistant did was to take, for each class, to take one set of facts uh, and have people uh, simply reread them and take another set of facts and take a test on them and get feedback. So one group simply reread, the other group took a quiz. They were asked a question, they provided an answer, guessing if they had to, and then they got feedback. And so basically we just said, is this retrieval practice effect that we found the idea of getting, asking people questions and getting them to produce the information. Will that work in real school material? So they either reviewed things or were quizzed on them. And then we tested them later. We gave them either a chapter test, just a couple weeks after this happened, into the semester test. And a few times they let us do, the, the chapter test and the semester test counted for grades. So the kids were really trying. We also gave them, uh, the, the school let us, it didn't count for a grade, but, but one year the school gave us a class period at the very end of school, uh, so in May, just as things were letting out, and, uh, you know, how it is at the end of the school year, you have a few days where nothing much happens. So they gave us one of those days, and the kids were not happy about it, but we tested them another time on stuff they had last October and November. So in May, you're getting st surprise tests on stuff you had October, November. We wanted to see if this effect would last. So here are results from an eighth grade science class. Um, and what we see is the items that were quizzed, the kids got 91% of them. They, got, they were at an A level on those items. Um, for the ones that they just got standard practice and then they reread those items, uh, they got about a 75, which is what the teacher told us her class performance usually was on these kinds of tests. Uh, on the end of the semester exam, the difference got smaller, but it was still there. And even at the end of the school year, on those items we had quizzed, rather than having the students reread, so they're exposed to all of them. But if we ask them a question and we made them think hard about the answer, we got an effect. So this retrieval practice effect works in the schools. We've made it work in a variety of college classes also. Uh, let me just check my notes here and see where we're going. So um, let me move back up to the university. How do I teach now? Uh, every class I teach, and a lot of people in the psychology department, and in fact a lot of people around Washington University are picking this up, I give a quiz in every class I teach, or if it's an upper level course, I would give a uh, uh, essay type assignment. I, I want the students, every, every time the student comes to class, they have to be engaged. Uh, and engagement to me is what really makes it, that too much of higher education is you have a mid-semester and a final exam. Well, when do students study if you have a mid-semester and a final exam? Right before the mid-semester exam and right before the final exam. And they kind of come and go, maybe studying, maybe not. In the meantime, um, that was certainly the way it was when I was in school and probably the way it was when you were in school, too. But what I have them do is every time they come to class, they either have to hand in a paper I've assigned, a topic, just three pages, uh, or I have them do it in class. I'll stop the class at various points and say, write a paragraph about X, where X is something that was in the reading and something I'm talking about. Give me your thoughts about it. That makes them pay attention in class. Uh, several people in my department give a little five to 10 minute quiz at the end of the, each uh, lecture, and it's over the readings and over the content of the lecture. So that means they have to do the readings before they show up to class, and they have to pay attention to the lecture because they're going to be quizzed on it. And then what we quiz are the main ideas. We don't pick out little picky things like what year was Abraham Lincoln born. Uh, we pick out the, the big things, the things we really want them to come away from the course with. What are the main themes, the big ideas? Um, 
I still give the regular test and I still give the final exam, uh, cumulative final exam, which makes them review everything again, but it's totally changed my classes by doing a little bit of retrieval practice every day. Um, now let's go back to this basic problem I just mentioned, uh, which um, is that uh, what I just showed you is that a way of learning, namely repeatedly rereading, that's very good in the short term is bad in the long term. And another method, uh, taking tests, which students don't like to do, it's difficult, uh, they have to dredge stuff up from memory, it's a very hard thing, and they don't show as much immediate learning, um, that, that helps them much more. So we have this curious condition that the things that the teachers would see in class and that the students would see themselves, they think, this is great, I'm learning fast. This is how I should learn. And the teachers think the same thing. Hey, this is great. I'm uh, teaching really well. The students are really picking it up. But what we don't stop to ask is, well, what are they going to know a week or a month or a year later? Which method is better then? Because usually what we measure is a pretty immediate test, except for things like cumulative final exams. So it's this curious problem that we have. Uh, and um, a, a psychologist at UCLA named Robert Bjork coined the name for this pattern of results of desirable difficulties. We normally think of wanting to make learning in the classroom and for ourselves pretty easy. I'd like to learn those names and faces fast. I'd like to learn uh, the states and the capitals if I'm assigned that in the history class fast. Well, the, often the techniques that produce fast learning produce fast forgetting. What we really want is durable, long-term learning, learning we can use later outside the classroom. And so he coined this term, uh, desirable difficulties, for introducing techniques in the classroom and in our own study strategies for things we want to learn that actually slow it down, make it harder, but make it last longer. So these include uh, what I just talked about, using tests rather than restudy presentations as learning events. And we'll talk about a few more. Varying the conditions of learning. There are lots of ways to do this. I'll describe one. Um, I'll talk about distributing or spacing study. How do we best do that? And also mixing up learning instead of doing it the way people usually prefer doing it, which is providing block practice. Uh, namely doing the same thing over and over until you get the hang of it. Uh, but the one point I want to make is that the word desirable is in here. Not every difficulty you introduce to learning makes it better. Some are just bad. So it's not like everything, anything I do to make learning difficult is going to make it better. That's why you need research. Because some things you do, even things that might seem plausible, sometimes just have, they hurt immediate learning and they hurt delayed learning. So, you have to do research to find out what works. Uh, so we don't really know yet, there, uh, the research on this is probably only 10 or 15 years old. We don't, I can't define what makes a desirable difficulty. We, we have to do the research to find out. But in general, it seems to be things, tasks that you give people that they can, so it's a difficult task, but they can do it, they can overcome it. So if I ask you to retrieve something, especially if I give you feedback, well, you can do that. Some of the difficulties that seem undesirable are things that just make things really bad uh, all around. But we can't define it more precisely than that. I wish we could, maybe in 10 years. Uh, so, as I mentioned, retrieval practice is an example of a desirable difficulty. What do I mean? Well, if you just repeat things over and over, uh, people first predict that they're going to do well. They think they've learned a lot just from repetition. They have learned a lot if you test them after five minutes, but if you wait a week, they do poorly. So that's a hallmark case of a desirable difficulty, something uh, that helps immediately but hurts in the long term, or to put it the other way, Retrieval practice is really the desirable difficulty. It hurts you immediately. You've only studied it once. You've taken three tests, uh, so you do worse after five minutes. But a week later, you're doing much better. So that's the classic pattern that Bjork calls a 
a hallmark of a desirable difficulty. So overall tests enhance learning, but what about failed tests? Suppose you make an error. Uh, and often uh, you read that you should pretest people. One, one way people teach is if you look in some textbooks now have a bunch of questions at the beginning of chapters. So you read those questions, but you can't answer them because you haven't read the chapter. Uh, suppose we force people to answer those questions ahead of time. Um, will making errors impair subsequent learning? Uh, and teachers, including myself for most of my career, have been terribly afraid of getting students to make errors because we think they'll learn the errors. Um, and you can find this, uh, this came out of work uh, uh, in the 1950s by a psychologist named B.F. Skinner, who many of you might remember. Um, but uh, I found this in a blog post by an instructional designer Two primary reasons for using the approach she was advocating uh, is that students don't, so that students will be prevented from making errors. So we don't want to establish an error history that's difficult to break. Minimizing errors reduces emotional and aggressive behavior that can occur following errors or avoidance of the work altogether. So in education, there's this rampant belief that we shouldn't have errors. Turns out errors are actually good. It doesn't matter. I mean, now we've, I had trouble believing this. It's not my own work. A lot of people did this research. It got replicated over and over, and now I'm a believer. But, and it helps with a desirable difficulty. Let me just give you a simple demonstration of this. Uh, so here was an experiment, again, with simple materials, but people have done these in classroom situations, too. Uh, suppose I tell you, look, I'm going, you're going to have to remember associates. And what I want you to do, I'm going to give you a word and you guess what associate I'm thinking of. But I'm actually going to pick associates that most people don't guess. In fact, almost nobody does. So I give you whale, and I give you eight seconds to come up with an associate. Let's say you say ocean. Perfectly good associate to whale. And I say, uh, so that's eight seconds. And I said, no, sorry, not what I had in mind. It was actually mammal. So now they have to say, uh oh, ocean's wrong. Got to remember mammal. So you'd think, having produced ocean, that's an error. Maybe they would screw up now and remember that on the test. Uh, this is the experimental condition where you have to generate something before you're corrected. In the control condition, the other, this is, um, you're just given 13 seconds with whale and mammal. Here, study this, you're gonna have to remember it. They don't generate an error. Here they get 13 seconds, here they get whale and mammal for only five seconds. So if it's just pure study time, this group ought to be better than this group. But in this group, they had to think hard about it and generate an error. So later on, we were given a test. The test is just gonna be giving them the left-hand members, the things they saw, either, uh, either they just read the pair or they generated and then read the pair. And we just have to see how many can they come up with. Uh, and the results in this experiment here, three, four, five, and experiments three, four, five, and six in a series. And in the read only case, despite the fact that all of these were 13 seconds, um, they varied some other things across these experiments. But in the read only case, you see that they're always worse than in the case where they got the test first, where they got whale and had to guess something. And only 2% of the time did they guess the right thing. So they usually got the wrong thing. So they made an error. Uh, then the error was corrected. And guess what? Having that error didn't do any harm at all. It, it actually helped. So if you think hard about something and then you're given the right answer, you remember it better. Uh, as I say, this was a total shock to me. This is a relatively recent research, 2009. Uh, I think a whole lot of psychologists didn't believe it, so they ran out to see if, do the experiment slightly differently, and everybody got the same finding. Um, uh, very counterintuitive to many, because I believe the whole error-producing story. But this is a way of making learning kind of difficult. You're giving people a task, making them generate, and then giving them the right answer, and that helps. Here's another version of the experiment I like done by some people at Columbia University. And they got people to say, hey, 
uh, after they'd done all this, they'd either read things for 13 seconds like whale mammal, or they generated and then read for only five seconds. And then after they recalled, so they'd done the whole experiment, after they recalled and they showed them, um, whoops, this is percent recall. I'll tell you what's over here in a second. Um, the, uh, they got the same effect. This is the testing first. They got a whopping big effect. This is percent recall. I forgot to put that over here. Um, and then the question was, what did people think that was better? They just shown in their behavior that the testing first was better. What they actually said, though, even after they recalled, I mean, it's hard to know when you're recalling which condition things were in, they still said afterwards they believe reading was better. Hey, you gave me 13 seconds to read that pair. Of course, that's better than only having five seconds. Well, no, even though they just produced these results, they still believe that, which is, of course, what I believe before I saw these data, and most psychologists believe. At any rate, generating, pre-testing, generating, makes you think hard about things. Then when you get the right answer, now, now producing errors is bad if they're not corrected, OK? You have to have immediate feedback. You have to correct yourself if you make an error. But if you do that, making the errors certainly doesn't hurt you and probably helps. Again, another desirable difficulty. I just said that. Let's switch to a different question, but a very fundamental one in learning and memory. Suppose you get two shots at some information. You get to study something twice. What's the best way to do that, to arrange it? Very old question. And I, I once gave a talk to a marketing department um, at, when I was at Purdue University. Uh, and I asked them, in the marketing world, that they measure memory. Yes? Sorry, David. Um, I have a question Yeah, you remember it better. If you produce it yourself, you remember it better. Yeah, if it's correct, yeah, you remember it better. And then I reinforce it, you remember it better. In these conditions, I only did that 2% of the time. <laughs> so it wasn't often. But yes, if you produce it yourself, you're, you're better off. I should have made that point. That's a good point. Thanks. Uh, back to the Super Bowl. Why is it that we see, I'm always amazed. I watch the Super Bowl, and here's an ad for Bud Light, and then the very next ad is for Bud Light. Back-to-back -back presentation of essentially the same ad under conditions that cost a fortune. Uh, so I asked people in marketing, why do you do that? Uh, why, why is that the way marketing works? Why, why don't you uh, do something different? Because uh, you know, the ad's right there. And in marketing, it's very hard for ads to, uh, for them to measure the impact of ads because there's so many other factors. But they can measure memory for ads. So they often measure uh, select households, and they'll measure memory for ads of the Super Bowl or something. And they, had, they said, we have the theory that if something is strong in memory, so I've just presented something, the best time to hit it again is immediately after presentation. You want to take something strong and make it even stronger. And it's a great theory. It's just exactly wrong. Uh, and yet it seems to drive millions of dollars uh, of advertising every year. It's not totally wrong, though, and that's probably why they do it. So in psychology, this is called the issue of mass versus space practice. Is it better to have things presented back to back, or is it better to have some space in between them? Um, and, and it's complicated. It's just like some of the other stuff we've talked about. There's, there's no straightforward rule. Uh, it's almost one, but so here's two presentations of something. Let's say it's a pair of words, uh, whale mammal. So you get it here, and then you get whale mammal here, and you take a test. So here's one where there's, the line indicates time. So this is space practice. This is mass practice. You get whale mammal back to back. Well, it's the same deal. If you test immediately after the second presentation, which must be what they do in marketing research, this is better. Uh, so mass presentation is better than space on an absolutely immediate test. But 
if you make that, if you make this interval between the second presentation, so when I've seen that second Budweiser ad, and the next time I'm in the grocery store looking at beer, uh, it's going to be, um, uh, oh, sorry. If you do exactly the same experiment, but you delay the test, it flip-flops. Now, the, so before mass presentation is greater, that's a greater sign than, than uh, space, but if you delay the test uh, beyond just an immediate test, it almost always is the opposite. Space presentation is better than mass presentation. So again, space presentation is another kind of desirable difficulty. Mass is better on an immediate test, but space is always better uh, virtually always. I mean, the literature, there's a huge literature on this, but 95% of the time, space presentation is better than mass. And usually the more space you make things, the better it is. So 10 minutes would be better than two minutes. Two minutes would be better than just a couple of seconds. So this is called the spacing effect. Uh, so the best thing for long-term retention is to study things widely separated. If you're trying to remember a set of names and faces, um, it's better to do it like once a day than to do it back to back the same day. If you've only got two shots at them, not that you would only have two, it's better to space out your know, presentations. So spacing is another desirable difficulty. Last one I want to talk about uh, these type is uh, blocked and mixed practice. If you think back to elementary education, you learned almost everything by block practice. You would say, here's addition. Now we'll do 20 addition problems. Here's subtraction. Now let's do 20 subtraction problems. And that's probably okay for multiplication, uh, for addition and subtraction. But when you get to more complicated problems, uh, suppose you're having to uh, uh, study how to find volumes of solids. Uh, you, so calculating the volume is all these complicated formulas and they're all these solids we had to learn in high school. Uh, cones, wedges, sears, and so forth. Um, and so people have done research on this asking what's the best way to learn how to calculate the volume. You've got an equation for it, you've got different numbers, you've got to learn how to plug those into the equation. So what I mean by block practice and mixed practice, well, block is simply doing the same kind of problem over and over. A's, so A's might be one solid, B's a different solid, C's a different solid. That's the way this is taught in the schools. You have a section of the chapter on those, you practice those over and over, and so forth. Uh, mixed practice, students don't like. Uh, they like block practice, teachers like block practice because you're learning faster. Mixed practice, you do one kind of volume, then a different one, then a third one, uh, and uh, mix them all up, not in exact order typically, uh, like I have there, but more, uh, more random than that. Um, so what happens when you learn this way? Well, here's an experiment actually using solids, that's why I use that example. Um, and during initial learning, people learn much faster in block practice because you're doing the same thing over and over again. You've got the same formula, you just need to plug it, the numbers in. So block practice is very good for initial learning uh, compared to mixed practice. But on a test, in this case, uh, a week later, people were then given, there were, there were four different types of solids that they had to learn to solve, and then a week later they got eight examples all mixed up. And now you see the people who had mixed practice were just as good as they ever were. The people who had blocked practice dropped way down. Why? Well, think about what's required on a test where you have all eight kinds of problems. You've got to figure out what kind of problem is this. You've got to discriminate. Oh, this is the spheroid problem. I've got to remember the spheroid equation. And if you've had Block practice, you've never had practice doing this. You knew before you even looked at the problem what kind it was. So what mixed practice does is to allow you to tell what is coming up. Uh, let me tell you about a baseball experiments that was done with the same idea, that the way batting practice is often done in baseball 
at almost every level, I hope it's changing, maybe that's what happened to the Cardinals this year, uh, is block practice. They say, okay, I'm going to throw you 15 fastballs. Now here's 15 change-up. Now here's 15 curves. Well, you know if you're batting what's coming. And guess what? You get better faster. Uh, the uh, uh, psychologists on a baseball team at a California state school uh, actually did this experiment. So they, uh, they used their normal batting practice, or they had mixed batting practice. They, you, never, you, you hit 15 of each type of pitch, but you never knew what was coming. And the, the batters didn't like it. They didn't do well. But uh, when they then gave them a test later, like a game situation, guess what? The game, the pitcher doesn't tell you, hey, fastball, get ready. You have to pick up what kind of pitch is coming. And so mixed practice lets you practice like you're going to play, whereas block practice brings you up to speed fast, but it doesn't let you differentiate among types of problems you're trying to face. So that's why uh, mixed practice, even though you need a lot more learning to get up to 89%, you'd have to give many more trials that you'll keep it, you'll retain it better over time. So let me come back to the why are good learning strategies often counterintuitive? Why don't we do them more often? Well, we've seen the answer several times. Because strategies that produce good performance in the short term, like blocking performance, like mass reading, uh, like mass presentation instead of space presentation, uh, so cramming or blocking, those produce great short-term performance, and so they're preferred. And I've talked to military trainers. How do you train people in the military? Well, we use, we, you know, we have 10 tasks we want to do. We teach them on the first one. We get them up to speed. Then the second one, get them up to speed. And I say, do they ever need to do that in the real world? I mean, don't they have to do things all willy-nilly? They don't do the first one, then the second one, then the third one. They said, yeah, but we want to make sure they know it. And there's something to that. So one, one idea would be to have mass practice to bring people up to speed, but then give them a whole lot of interleave practice so they'd have to learn to do things out of context. Um, but, but teachers and trainers uh, and coaches often want to see people improve. And people want to see themselves improve. And if you use blocked mass practice like this or cramming, you improve very fast. The problem is you lose it very fast. So if you want durable long-term learning, you need to do the opposite often of what seems intuitively good, like massing and, and blocking. So uh, to kind of sum up, uh, and I'm going to give you some other points. I have it built into the talk now. Um, but to make learning sick, practice getting information out. Practice retrieving stuff. If you need to know a set of information, if you're having trouble with your, I have trouble with, uh, I don't know why, uh, proper names, by the way, are the first things to go when you age. So if you're having trouble coming up with proper names, uh, nobody knows why, nobody has a clue, but it shows up in every study. I have trouble with restaurant names. Um, so that uh, I will think uh, I can picture the restaurant, I know I've been there 10 times before, I can't come up with this name quite often. Um, how to do that? Well, you need to practice those. If you're having trouble coming up, like I do with my students, uh, if I'm having trouble coming up with their names, create the, the essence of flashcards or, or something like that so you can practice. Here's the face. What's the name? Practice getting that name out. You know the name perfectly well. If I gave you the face, say you can't recall the name of this face, this friend of yours, if I gave you a multiple choice test, you'd get it 100% of the time. You know the name, you're just having trouble making it come out of your mouth. Practice that. Practice that retrieval route of uh, seeing the name and producing, uh, seeing the face and producing the name. Space and mixed up practice. Even though it feels good just to study something over and over, it's not going to be good for long-term retention. Uh, think about that generation experiment. Try to figure something out before you give yourself the answer. It will help me if I'm trying to remember Almond's restaurant. Came up with it. In uh, Clayton, uh, if I try to think of it and can't, it's better for me to have tried to think of it and then look it up than it is just to look it up without even trying, just to say, this is hopeless. 
other general tips on, um, uh, on remembering, uh, there are many more, I'm just picking out a few from our book to talk about. Uh, one of the best ways of learning new information is to connect it to what you already know. You already know an awful lot. You've lived a long time, you know a huge amount of material. If you can connect what you're trying to learn to stuff you already know, you'll know it better. It's a kind of mystery of learning and memory that the more you know about something, you might think, well, it's harder to remember. It's like the famous Harvard ichthyologist who claimed, every time I learn a new student's name, I forget the name of a fish. Well, it's a good joke, but it doesn't work that way. When you know a whole lot, uh, you learn more easily. Think of somebody who knows a lot about baseball and somebody who's only seen a few games and never paid attention. If they see an inning of baseball, this has actually been done in a psychology study, the people who are experts pick up much more information, even though the people who are not experts have much more to learn. Same thing is true with chess. If you show grandmasters a chessboard with pieces in a partially filled game versus just ordinary good players, but not grandmasters, the grandmasters can remember those much better. But if you put pieces randomly on a chessboard, chess grandmasters can't do any better than you or me. Um, they have to be in a meaningful configuration. So we should try to elaborate what we're learning too. If you're learning something new, connect it to something you already know, and then think about it, reflect on it. Reflection is kind of part of retrieval. Reflect on what does it mean? How do I integrate this into what I already know? Uh, Restate things in your own words. If something comes from the outside, pause. I tell people when they're reading, if it's something you want to remember, um, pause every now and then and summarize it to yourself. I had a, uh, I was applying for a grant in Washington in the Department of Education, and my program officer, the one woman who was going to give me the grant, was a little skeptical about what we were claiming. And so she decided to do it herself one day. So she would ride the train in from the suburbs of Washington. So she picked up the Washington Post and she decided she was going to read 10 stories. And after each story, she was just going to shut the paper and mentally summarize it to herself. Uh, and she did that for 10 stories on the way in. That night she got home and she opened a briefcase and she found her newspaper and gave it to her husband and said, hey, read me the headlines of the 10 stories that she marked and let me try to remember what's in those stories. And she did a great job. Why? Because she practiced retrieval right after reading it. She essentially put herself in the testing condition and we got the grant. So that was good news. Um, another good way of remembering is making things into a story, a narrative. Human beings are great at remembering stories. Uh, we're just terrific. If you can take a set of information and make it into a coherent narrative, you're in good shape. Uh, also, I don't know how many of you might have read a book called Moonwalking with Einstein. There's a, uh, it's a wonderful book by Joshua Ferg. You learn a lot about learning and memory. Um, but they recommend forming mental images, that if you form mental images, you remember things better, especially if you make them interact. We, we discuss that in our book a lot, too, in the later chapters. So all these things are very good for memory. Let me talk about just a few other things because of the questions I often get. What about memory fitness? You read all this stuff these days about how to get your mind to be sharper. Uh, well, what about exercise? And actually the, the evidence on exercise is very compelling that if you just exercise, and I don't mean strenuous, I mean just going for long walks, getting your, uh, think of, you know, the brain uh, is a physical organ like all other organs of the body. The more oxygen you get up to your brain, the better off you are. Um, exercise helps. My mother, uh, who's now deceased, but when she was getting older and complaining about her memory, she would do things like crossword puzzles and Jeopardy. And that's fine. It wouldn't go help any, but, you know, if you enjoy doing that, great. But I told her, you'd be a whole lot better off if you get out of your apartment and go walking up and down the street, which I could never get her to do very effectively, unless I was home and kind of lead her around. She thought she could help herself. You're much better off doing physical exercise than you are doing mental exercise. Uh, challenging and meaningful intellectual activity helps, though. Reading, uh, Jeopardy probably helps. What about all the brain games, Lumosity? How many people have tried Lumosity here? Anybody? 
few, one, two, three, four. My sister does it. I mean, she likes it. And I don't think it hurts anything. I just don't think it's as good as other things you could be doing. Uh, there's no real evidence that the claims made for lumosity are true, as far as I know yet. Um, they, they claim they have research, but they never publish it. Uh, other general tips, focusing with fewer distractions. Why are we having so much trouble? Why do students have so much trouble? Well, uh, I was just at a talk. Uh, they all sit in their classrooms now. You have, probably haven't seen a class. And they have their cell phones, and they have computers. Well, I have colleagues, I haven't quite gotten to the stage yet, but I think I'm about to, who ban computers and cell phones from their class. They're just too distracting. It's too tempting to get on Facebook or something. Focus. If you really want to learn something, be in a quiet place and focus. As we age, our ability to concentrate and focus and pay attention declines. We need to put ourselves in quiet spaces to do that. I have a room I go in with nothing except me and the book or whatever it is I need to do. So I can't look up on the shelf and say, oh, the Iliad. I always meant to read that, but I didn't. Um, so focusing, writing things down seems like a simple suggestion, but if you put things in your own words, if you summarize things, that helps. And then you can practice retrieval, as I mentioned. Um, as far as remembering things, uh, people claim to be very forgetful. Well. There's so many aids now. There's a book that came out a few years ago about why are surgeons and airline pilots and other professions, what have they done uh, to cut down the accident rates? When I was growing up, and many of you, airplane accidents in the United States were pretty frequent occurrences. I knew people from my hometown who died in airplane accidents. Now, despite the fact that there are many more airplanes flying around, they're pretty uncommon the pilots have a checklist, a very detailed checklist they go through before they take off. That's been developed over years. Surgeons have exactly the same thing. Here's a checklist. So if you're worried about organizing your life, provide yourself a very compelling checklist, uh, to-do list, a calendar, but make it detailed. And the other general tip is have multiple cues to remind you of what you want to do. Don't have, uh, like, uh, I don't do this well enough myself. <laughs> Uh, my colleague, Mark McDaniel, the co-author who wrote the book, he still has a paper and pencil to-do list. He has a calendar and he writes things in it and erases them. I have an electronic one. If my computer goes away, I'll have no idea what I'm supposed to do for the next month. Um, that's the problem. I mean, if he lost his book, I guess he'd be in the same way, but uh, computers seem to fail more than I lose books. Okay, well, I'm happy to throw things open to questions. Um,